On behalf of the Tredegar Society, it is my great honor to welcome you to the American Civil War Museum for this uh, September edition of our education series. This series is brought to you in part by a generous contribution from the law firm of Hunt and Williams. Since its founding in Richmond, Hunt and Williams has grown to more than 800 attorneys and 19 offices in North America, Europe, and Asia, and represents clients across the full spectrum of industries that make up today's global economy. In addition, last year, every single lawyer at Hunt and Williams participated in pro bono service. As a firm, they contribute more than 50,000 hours each year to community service and charitable projects, including many hours of service to this museum. We thank them for their support of this museum and the speaker series. We are uh, in for a treat tonight as we spend time considering federalism and federal coercion from the point of view of two important Virginia authors, advocates, political theorists, and lawyers. Uh, both of these men have roots that are firmly in Virginia, but uh, unfortunately they both didn't think that William and Mary was going to make the cut, and they went off to Princeton for their education. They are men who have thought deeply about democracy and how we can actually make it work um, now, one of these is obviously, you know, the father of our Constitution, James Madison, but the other, and we're, we're very lucky, is our speaker. Um, Michael uh, Signer graduated from Washington Lee High School in Arlington and was magna cum laude from Princeton. He earned a PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley and a JD from the University of Virginia. Um, after law school, he was an attorney at William Cutler Pickering Hale and Door. In 2005, he was appointed by Governor Warner, Governor Mark Warner, as one of his two uh, counselors uh, in, in the gubernatorial office here in Richmond. He's the author of a wide variety of really of marvelous books and articles, uh, including um, a book. Uh, called Demagogue, The Fight to Save Democracy from Its Works, uh, from, uh, it's from its enemies, right? Sorry, I put an extra word in my summary. Uh, and the book we'll draw on tonight, which is in many ways a, a, a second volume to that, to that other work called Becoming Madison, The Extraordinary Origins of the Least Likely Founding Father. As if all this weren't enough, he's a, hus a husband and a father of, of twin boys in Charlottesville. He's going to be on the city council in, in Charlottesville in the spring. Um, and he serves on, uh, in a leadership role in a, in a, in a large number of really vital, uh, of vital charities uh, and, and uh, think tanks. Um, and, you know, just because he didn't have enough to do, he started his own law firm as well, which is, um, you know, appropriately named... Uh, the Madison Law and Strategy Group. So please, please join me in welcoming our speaker. So this, this event will be notable for being probably the first and last time that I've been likened to James Madison. Um, but I, I really appreciate that. I'm gonna, first thing I'll, I'll go home and tell my wife. <laughs> Uh, so I was told that I had two hours to speak tonight. Um, so no, I'm gonna. Um, uh, so this is really a great um, uh, opportunity. It's nice to talk to you all. It's nice to talk to whoever watches this um, online. I want to thank you all for the for what you're doing here with the society, what the museum um, is is doing in Virginia, and offering the different perspectives on this crucial chapter in our history, especially which is getting more and more and more crucial as the years go on. Uh, so. Um, a little bit of background on the book before I get into the subjects of the, of the talk. Uh, so this is a book called Becoming Madison, The Making the Extraordinary Origins of the Least Likely Founding Father. Uh, what I wanted, the I, I, I got stuck on James Madison a long time ago. Um, uh, when I was in an undergraduate at Princeton, his spirit kind of lingers over you almost every day as this really unique um, product of that particular education and somebody who charted out a course as a pretty active combatant in politics against great odds to be that sort of person given that he was five foot four and 100 pounds and suffered from um, chronic anxiety disorders and was terminally shy and was intellectual and didn't like politics and a whole host of other things that that 
person would still have kind of hurled himself into practical politics upon returning to Virginia and made such a profound impact on our country fascinated me from, from, for a long time. And it also frustrated me that he was so overlooked at the, um, for the sake of Thomas Jefferson. And that we, you know, we joke in Virginia politics that we do have a section of the code somewhere where you have to cite Thomas Jefferson at least once in every speech um, anywhere. And we don't have that section about James Madison. And there, I think that the um, disservice, the overlooking of Madison almost at every turn speaks more deeply of a problem in our politics, I think. And to the extent that we can carve out more space for this sort of a statesman, and that's really the topic of the book, I think that it's an important um, recalibration of the way that we think about poss possibility within politics, and especially the responsibility of leaders to challenge and lead the public and to challenge prejudices, which was, um, and to educate the public which was kind of the, the bread and butter of how he found his success. And that's really the, the story of the book. The book is a psychological and intellectual biography of Madison in his younger years, in his coming of age and his rivalry with Patrick Henry as he sought to get the Constitution ratified, developed and ratified. And that kind of plot, to me, is quite cinematic. You have um, a, a, a young man coming together over great obstacles. You have finding um, a great cause, and then you have the, a, a, a great battle, um, which culminates in the ratifying convention here in Richmond in 1788, where he and Patrick Henry, who he had previously worked for, did battle. Um, and he won. He won. And that it's, it's still, every, every time I, I, um, I think about it, it becomes a more improbable and more exciting story for that reason. So I, I, that's the book. Um, but I've been asked to talk here today about a particular take of the book, which is what does this, how does this tee up a lot of things that happened with the Civil War? And um, so that is the issue of coercion. Uh, so let me just tell you the status quo. So Madison got to the United States Congress. Um, he got elected in 1779 and came into office in 1780. Um, he was 29 years old. And uh, he had served previously as counsel to um, one of six counselors to Patrick Henry when he was governor. It was a very critical position in Virginia at this point. You actually couldn't make major executive decisions without your counsel saying, okay. And he had also served as a delegate to the, Constitution, to the convention that chartered um, at, well, at the Independence Convention in Virginia. Um, and then he had served as a delegate in Virginia's legislature also. So he, a seat opened up in Congress and he decided to move from the state to go to the federal government. He um, was going to, the tradition at this point, he got elected in November, was to take off for Philadelphia before the winter hit because the, the roads became impassable and you were supposed to get to Philadelphia. Um, he decided to stay home in Montpelier at his father's house for the whole winter and to study on his own. And he kind of repeated a pattern which he would do throughout his life where you and I might not find it exciting to hole up in a, in a library with a bunch of books basically on our own, but this to him was like a wonderland. And he did that specifically on the topic of inflation. So the country at this point was suffering in, the, in Virginia from galloping inflation and it was really becoming crippling. So you had, I think, at least four different kinds of currency in different states. You had the states, um, you had the states currency, you had new federal specie, which was a new kind of currency that had been invented to try and supplant the old one. Then you had federal dollars. Then you had other states' dollars, which were coming into your state, and all of them were inflated. And it was really a problem that was affecting your day-to-day -day quality of life. When he ultimately got to Congress, the figures of what he spent on haircuts were in the thousands of dollars. And it wasn't, and he thought that that was appalling and absurd. Because of inflation, you couldn't pay your troops reliably, and we were still in the revolution, in the in the in the war which was going on. You couldn't purchase food and tents and clothing to reliably get to the troops who were on the battlefield, and so you had a real. Um, it was crippling the country. It was an existential threat. The fact that the money didn't work, and he decided to stay home by himself and study and crack that problem. Um, and what he did was he wrote an essay. 
that he didn't publish for 11 years. And this was also another quirky Madison thing. He just kind of needed to solve the problem with himself and give himself a blueprint for what he was going to do. And the memorandum that he wrote to himself after several months' study was a discovery that the problem with money was not about the supply of money itself or the dollars or economics. It was about the people's faith and the redeemability of the currency by the government itself. So it was this kind of, you can imagine the Einstein light bulb moment going on while he's burrowed during this very harsh winter by himself at Montpelier. And it was kind of the first inkling that he needed to crack a much bigger problem that had to do with the federal government itself and the people's relation to that government and their thoughts about that government because money was unredeemable unless you add a central entity that could actually make it count. So he wrote an essay where that was his discovery. Um, he ultimately leaves for Congress um, in, the late, in the late spring over very bad roads and he gets there and one of the first things that he does is he writes back a letter to his friend Thomas Jefferson who is now governor of Virginia and he wrote something that was considered so shocking that it was excised from the official Madison letters and papers until the 20th century. And what he wrote was that the key, and this is the, the quote, the key defect affecting the country is a defect of adequate statesmen in, in Philadelphia. So that was this kind of searing judgment on all of his peers, anybody who was serving in the Confederated Congress. And... Um, it was, it was consistent with what a lot of other people had been saying about Philadelphia at that point, which was, it was kind of um, salacious and corrupt. George Washington wrote these letters where he said, they're all wasting money and spending time in restaurants. And there was a sense that people were fiddling while the ship of state was sinking. And not just that, but like kind of getting a kick out of it. And so you needed somebody to come to town who had a different attitude and one of the points of this book is to try and flesh out that idea that the key word in what he said there was a defect of adequate statesmen. We tend to think of the word statesman now as referring to foreign diplomats. If that, we really think about it as referring to people who are, you know, kind of um, great, you know, engraved in marble and sitting on pedestals and it's sort of an unattainable ideal for a certain kind of person involved in politics. Whereas what to me is so revealing about what he says when he gets to Philadelphia is this was not those things at all. It was, you know, it was, a, it was somebody serving in federal office in a small country with crippling problems facing them every day that needed to be addressed, like now. And that was what he set out to become himself, a statesman, in what that meant for him at the time. So... That started bringing him to this topic of coercion. So a lot of people think, to the extent they've thought about this at all, so coercion is a very simple word that means that I force you to do something. I get you to do something through force. Um, to the extent people think about this at all, they think that Madison came to the topic of coercion, which was basically creating a new federal government that would have forceful authority over the states, over the in, in our federalist design. They think that he came to that through this very famous memo he did um, doing research on confederacies in the year before the Constitutional Convention in 1787. So he started doing this research. Jefferson, if you've read any of these books, Jefferson, he asked Jefferson to send him a box of books on the ancient um, confederacies. Jefferson sends him a box of books in 1786. He starts studying Burring in the books, then he writes this memo, and that guides a lot of his thinking and the speeches that he does in Philadelphia during the Constitutional Convention where he's citing the Greek Confederation and the Belgian Confederation and all these confederations that have fallen apart. My research suggests that he, that he came to these ideas much earlier and in a much... Um, harder, more intense way. So uh, soon after he arrived in Congress, one of the very earliest ventures he took was to support an amendment to the Articles of Confederation that would have given Congress clearly militarily coercive authority. Uh, so there was a committee in Congress that was charged with giving Congress the necessary powers for executing the Articles of Confederation, and so Madison joined it and seized on the opportunity to translate what he had been learning with the inflation research and some of the other things that he'd been studying 
and he drafted a, a, a quite startling new amendment that stated that if any of the states, quote, shall refuse or neglect to abide by the determinations of the United States and Congress assembled, that the Congress would then be, quote, fully authorized to employ the force of the United States as well by sea as by land to compel such state or states to fulfill their federal obligations. So if you think about how radical that is in 1781, um, and he, he, he flogged this for a couple of years after that. So this is, this is several years before the Constitutional Convention, and he's, you know, you get three years in Congress at this point, you get a single term, and he's a fresh new, you know, 30-year-old coming to, coming to Congress. And um, this would, it, it, was, it, was, it was quite radical to, to propose this idea. Um, the amendment went on to give Congress the power to prevent dissenting states from trade and intercourse, which meant uh, both domestic and foreign, meaning Congress could bend the states to its will by choking off its commerce, so basically imposing blockades or embargoes on a particular state. Uh, so Madison needed allies for this idea. Um, at this point, Thomas Jefferson was... Um, had Now he was abroad in Paris, so was, the governorship had ended, um, and he wrote him twice... Um, so for a period of about two years, he wrote him twice in two weeks, then again in five months. It's, it's really funny how plaintive and, and pleading his, his letters to Jefferson are, where he's saying, uh, at first he says, I'd really like for you to support this idea. I think it's excellent and quite needed. And then he, then he says, he writes him two weeks later, he says, did you, get my, <laughs> did you get my letter? And then he writes him six months later, he said, did, did you get my letter? Jefferson, and this was part of the dance between Madison and Jefferson. A lot of the time, there were these weird omissions between them. Another example much later is that Madison didn't tell Jefferson about the Federalist Papers until a year after they had finished, about this campaign of op-eds that he was orchestrating with Hamilton. He didn't even let him know. Um, so he, um, he needs allies, and, um, and Jefferson does not respond. And uh, so, because it was too radical for Jefferson, I think, is the idea. Um, uh, so, what, so he, he doesn't, there's no traction that he senses for the, the battle for, for this military coercive authority at this point. Um, so he starts pursuing it through another avenue, which is for what was called an impost at the time, which would be to, I, in the book I translate it as a forced contribution because the language of impost is so antiquated, but this would be to require every state government to dedicate 5% of its, um, of its revenues to the federal government. So you would basically force them to fund the federal government. And uh, in 1871, that became the basis of Madison's first um, nationally famous action. He made a motion stating that it was the opinion of Congress for the establishment of permanent and adequate funds that would operate generally throughout the country, and he said that that would be indispensably necessary. And this kind of created, and he stood up made that speech and it created a, a, a huge commotion and he started being attacked. And under attack he said that he had proposed the idea on the quote, ruins of public faith and national honor and that the status quo fighting back, he said, should be horrid to anyone with either honesty or pride. He said Congress needed a general revenue operating throughout the United States under the superintendence of Congress. Virginia's legislature had decided that it opposed the impost, which was really embarrassing to Madison that he couldn't even get control of his own state. And uh, this was one of the initial things that led to the breach between him and Patrick Henry, who, remember, he had worked for as his counselor. Um, he said, and this was really important, he said, yes, it was embarrassing, he admitted this, but he said he owed allegiance not to Virginia, sitting there in Congress as a congressman from Virginia, but to the collective interests of the whole. And in that speech, he started to develop a kind of mode of political combat, which started becoming very important to his successes later on in his political career, which I call in the book Madison's Method. Um, he walked the delegates through the logic of the situation. He said there were only two options for paying the debt the United States did have, and this is how he presented it. He said, first, you could pay the principal on the debt, or set, and the United States had a pretty large outstanding interest that debt that the Congress had to pay. Pay the interest, or you pay the principal. And 
he just proved using facts that Congress could only afford using its current budget that was funded to pay the interest. So that, and he walks you down a logical path, he said that only gives you two other options, occasional requisitions on the states because Congress didn't have its own budget, uh, which was what they were doing then, or each state establishing a permanent fund to fund the government. And he said both of them had fatal flaws. Um, he proved that. So he said there was no choice but Congress establishing a general revenue plan. And uh, it, was, it was kind of startling for everybody to have this little man, again, walking them through using logic to force them toward conclusions that were indisputably true on a matter of great public necessity where they were failing. And this is what he did. Um, on the on the impost. So three months later, he came back to the chamber and he delivered the first speech that would make him nationally famous. Um, he stated that the 5% mandatory contribution would be a, quote, full reward for the blood, the toils, the cares, and the calamities which had purchased it. He said if Congress failed, then the last and fairest experiment in favor of the rights of human nature would be insulted and silenced by the votaries of tyranny and usurpation. So thousands of copies of that speech were printed and distributed not just around the country, but even in England and France. Um, George Washington wrote an introduction that praised the speech for so much dignity and energy that in my opinion, no real friend of the honor and independency of America can hesitate a single moment. Um, the impost was ultimately defeated kind of through, there were many votes against it and many votes that failed and kind of wither on the vine. That was one of the reasons that the Constitutional Convention ultimately was called after a failed fiscal convention in Annapolis um, a few years later that was meant to address these issues. That didn't work. So, um, uh, okay, so fast forward a couple of years to the lead up to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, Madison is brewing all these years on the light bulb that he had had at the very beginning, which was the federal government needed coercive authority over the states to force them to comply. That was the lesson that he was, that he would continue reinforcing through the, the research that he would do. So he writes Jefferson before the Constitutional Convention that the principle that must tower, quote, above and ab over and above all else was the need to give the federal government, quote, a negative in all cases whatsoever on the states. The states would then be prevented from, quote, thwarting and molesting each other, and minorities would be pre prevented from, quote, unrighteous measures which favor the interest of the majority. So then he goes about writing his famous memorandum on the vices of, of the Confederacy, and in that, the topic of co coercion again looms large. He writes, a sanction is as essential to the idea of law as coercion is to that of government. Um, he said that the Articles of Confederation, which was the, what we had been operating under previously, contained so fatal an omission stemmed from the state's mistaken confidence that justice, good faith, honor, and sound policy would prevail. Now remember that because what he's doing is he's taking a swipe at idealism. So one of the things that's going on with trying to design a government around these ideas was um, a pretty... Uh, preventive idea of government that is going to stop a collapse rather than achieve or depend on justice, such nice things as justice, good faith, honor, and even sound policy. So Madison writes Washington a letter before the Constitutional Convention, Convention stating that the national government needed to be, quote, armed with positive and complete authority in all cases which require uniformity as well as a negative in all cases whatsoever. It's italicized on the legislative acts of the states. He said the right of coercion should be expressly declared. Now one of the things that I, this is gonna get more subtle as I finish up, um, but I enjoyed this part of the book because it tweaks simplistic renderings of history that are trying to use history for partisan purposes. So um, I, you know, I get a, kick out of people trying to say Madison is a fan of limited government because Madison had a very complicated career through the very idea of government itself, as this indisputably shows. Okay, so his opinion changed as he went on, but you had differing opinions about what government needed to do, and the federal government specifically at different stages of the, Amer of the American story. Um, Okay, so uh, during the convention, Madison says during one debate, um, he argues that coercion, so b before you even get there, he and George Mason and Edmund Randolph, and Randolph had cooked up the Virginia plan, which was basically separate branches of government 
um, the presidency being constructed the way that it was, the judiciary being constructed the way that it was, the, the Senate and the House by Camel legislature. So um, what he really wanted them to side with was this coercion principle. And Madison, Mason and Randolph fell away from that. So he didn't have agreement from them going into it. But he still kept on hitting it over and over and over again during the Constitutional Convention. And he, um, during one debate, um, I think like in July, he argued that coercion would be quote, the great pervading principle that must control the centrifugal tendency of the states. And without it, they would, quote, continually fly out of their proper orbits and, quote, destroy the order and harmony of the political system. So Jefferson, in turn, writes Madison back. He gets a, he's getting updates on what's happening. And he says about this particular idea of the federal veto on state acts, federal negative on state acts, armed by coercive military authority, it fails in an essential character that the whole and patch should be commensurate. Very few of state's laws touched on federal issues, that was his reasoning, and so a veto on all state laws would upset the apple cart, upset, be, be imbalanced. That was Jefferson's response. So Madison ultimately loses this battle. Um, we end up with the Supremacy Clause, which reads, um, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. So that sets up a state law has to conflict specifically with a federal law that has been passed by Congress. So Congress doesn't get the presumptive right to strike down any state law irregardless or regardless of a conflict with, with a past federal statute. Um, quite, I mean, hugely important distinction. Um, so when Madison lost that battle about coercion, the express right of coercion declared in the Constitution, it poisoned his view of the entire Constitution. Some people think that he actually sank into a mild depression for the month or few weeks after the Constitutional Convention. He wrote Jefferson a, a very dark letter back where he said that the plan, the entire Constitution that comes out of Philadelphia, would neither effectually answer its national object nor stop the, quote, local mischiefs that everywhere excite disgust against the state governments. So what started to happen in the next few weeks, so now we're at 17, the fall of 1787 leading up to the Federalist Papers starting to be done, to, to distributed, is Madison starts this very strange process of falling in love with the object that had been his great disappointment, but a huge matter of labor for him. And he starts getting more and more focused on control um, as a as kind of something that both he is going to do as a political actor and as an object of his political philosophy for the for the um, for the country, so in the Federalist Papers, which uh, Hamilton recruits him into um, after he and Jay start writing them in the in the fall, um, I mean you all there are many many famous ones, um, but this starts to become a major motif. Um, these themes in uh, in a number of the Federalist Papers. And these are basically op-eds that are written not only for the New York papers, where New York, you have 13 states, you need a supermajority of them um, to pass the Constitution. New York is a very critical um, state, so those papers there. But when I teach this in my classes at UVA, and I, ha and I explain to these to my students, the thing you have to understand is that people at this time read in much longer format than we do now, and they there was a smaller group of people who were involved in public affairs because you had to own property and, and be a white male and all these variety of other discriminations were embodied in, in the criteria to be involved in, in all this. So, um, but reading these Federalist Papers is analogous to reading op-eds today. So you were, they were basically op-eds to people who were either going to be directly going to a convention a small country at this point, or who are going to know and be talking to the people who are going to be delegates to a convention. So these were, um, this was a marketing campaign. So you, you, they just were longer and more complicated than a lot of 800 word op-eds that we read today. But that was what they were. So he was writing articles to that population, try, fervently trying to get them to side with the Constitution, which he had now decided to fight tooth and nail for, because the alternative was so terrifying to him, even if he had condemned it right afterward as saying that it would failed. So the reversal is, is, is stunning. So in number 38, um, Federalist number 38, 
uh, Madison says that the lifeless mass of the Confederacy had generated a, quote, defective construction of the supreme government of the Union, and that America was like a patient with a disorder growing worse. And he said, we basically were being serviced by quacks, by really faulty doctors, and that they could not deny the necessity of a speedy remedy nor agree in proposing one. Um, and if the quacks remedies were applied, that the dissolution of usurpation would be the dreadful dilemma. So this was the, what we were faced with. And number 51, which became very famous for the idea that ambition must be made to counter ambition through all levels of the government, the three branches of government, um, the, uh, he, he, and the, the relationship of the federal government to the states, he specifically praised the, quote, judicious modification and mixture of the federal principle. So what that means is that you had the way that the Constitution set up the federal government relating to the states was, even though it failed in what he had originally wanted, which was direct coercion, he came to appreciate the that ambition was being made to counteract ambition and that the two sides had something in common, which was caught in the book, I talk about it as a nexus imperii. So it was a, it's a phrase in Latin that he was taught by his teacher, John Witherspoon. So it's a kingly connection between two things that makes them depend on one another um, crucially. So that was how the state and the federal governments actually ended up working with each other. They're intended to conflict and they're intended to be codependent. And that's one of the reasons that the Senate has this incredibly unjust, unfair, unrepresentative compromise of two senators for each state, whereas the House of Representatives has um, the senators, it's much easier for them to represent the whole state because they don't have to deport, uh, depend on population. Um, okay, so speeding up and going forward to the ratifying convention that's called in Richmond the next, um, starting next May, um, Madison travels down to Richmond and by this point Patrick Henry has become um, a vicious, virulent, um, violent foe of the Constitution, basically on grounds that we would consider today, we would describe them today as states' rights. Um, Patrick Henry had been kind of the revolutionary hero of, of the whole country. He was considered the father and the godfather of the revolution. Um, and he... Um, uh, he and he and Madison had started diverging over a whole number of things. One of which was um, just the idea. Henry, Henry had proposed the um, an idea a, a new tax that would be implemented for supporting Christian churches, which was a kind of populist measure that he had done in 1783. And one of the moments when Madison again became very famous across the country was in his memorial and remonstrance against religious assessments, which is the Western world's probably most famous statement of the doctrine of the separation of church and state, which he did in the context of a political battle to defeat a very populist, um, demagogic uh, Virginia political hero who he had worked for, and that was five years before the, the ratifying convention happened. So by this point, they really had a history. <laughs> and. Patrick Henry is, is over six feet tall, uh, robust, strong, older, and, pa and, and Madison is, is this minute, you know, the figure I described to you before. And one of the most interesting things that happens in the three-week ratifying convention is Madison collapses twice from this an anxiety disorder that he'd had his whole life, which is now modern psychiatry calls it psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, which is a fancy word for panic attacks for somebody who had his psychological makeup. And there's a lot of evidence to support that. That's one of the novel things that the book does um, is finally convincingly make that case, um, I think. So Henry, um, through the ratification battle, um, he... Uh, he basically framed federal power and what had emerged from the from Philadelphia as suspicious, as alien, as reckless, as elitist, um, and he combined a whole set of critiques. And Madison became kind of the figurehead of all of them. Um, to me, it's summed up in this one onslaught that he does against, and it's like this incredibly dramatic thing. There, there are these huge thunderstorms that come up that, that rake the building with lightning that cause everybody to shut down, and it's right at the moment when Henry kind of does his biggest speeches, and then there's another time where there's a duel that almost spills out because of how vicious the 
the um, attacks are getting against each other, but he mocks the, quote, microscopic eyes of modern statesmen when he's attacking Madison and all these conspirators who came out, these, these pinheads who came out of Philadelphia who just were coming up with schemes that were mysterious and that were going to threaten Virginia. And he actually had um, commercial interests. So there was this Kentucky block of delegates at the ratifying convention, all of whom were going to be threatened if the Mississippi River's trade rights and navigation rights were compromised, which was not going to happen. It wasn't in the designs, but there was a lot of fear mongering that was happening for very provincial reasons. So in any political debate, you always have, or is my self-interest going to be hazarded by whatever your idea is? And that he had no inhibitions, whatever, about playing to people's fear that their self-interest would be hurt. Um, and then his big, Patrick Henry's big idea was to impose the Bill of Rights as a prior condition on the Constitution, which would kill it. So if you said, we need all the states to go back to the drawing board, put a Bill of Rights in before the Constitution is passed, um, and then we'll go back and do it again. And that was meant to be a poison pill that would kill the whole process. And he never, he, he was a vicious foe of the Constitution being passed. Okay, so uh, Madison wins. Um, it's, it's the great victory of his life. When he writes a biography when he's in his 80s, it basically, he basically finishes. He doesn't even talk about the presidency barely at all or being Secretary of State. He basically focuses almost all of his time on the events leading up to this, the, the, the climax of his life. So that's one of the reasons I focus on it so much in the book. Um, but in later years, he becomes just as tortured as we are today by, this, by, the, by the right balance on this coercion question. So when the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed during the administration of John Adams, this was a federal statute passed by Congress to criminalize political speech. And you could be locked up, and there was a fear that you were siding with France if you, if you were um, not taking the American side, and if you were attacking the administration of John Adams, that you were fomenting sedition. Um, there, he authored what was called the Virginia Resolution, and Jefferson authored the Kentucky Resolution, and this was in direct contrast, conflict, to the coercion doctrine that he had been authoring just um, 15 years earlier, uh, which was a state trying to defy a federal statute. What grounds could you do that on? Um, his rationale, which was agony for him to work out, and he spent dozens and dozens and dozens of pages and letters to colleagues trying to work out for himself. And it's fascinating to read his mind trying to um, make these things coherent. And it was because the Alien Sedition Acts, he said, were intrinsically unconstitutional. And that was up to the states as original partners in the Constitution to adjudicate. So if the state was determining this was unconstitutional, that was within its right as part of the, so it could challenge the Congress on such a crucial matter. Tricky though, tricky, really tricky to, to how do you apply it there and not to other things. So uh, then in the 1830s, there was the nullification crisis, which really brought him into, um, into a crisis. So again, good scholarship suggests that he spent a year bedridden because he was so anxious and frustrated with what was happening to the country that he had fallen in love with. Um, so you had um, South Carolina basically um, on on grounds that were not so much about a constitutional principle like free speech, it was about naked political power, the South Carolina legislature's ability to challenge tariff um, and trade legislation from Congress. Uh, they, they, this was the, the crisis, and this, that idea of nullification that a state could just overtly challenge and defy the federal government on crucial matters for its own self-interest was the battle that led up to the Civil War. Um, so he, um, in 1821, before all this happened, he had had a pretty confident view of the system. He wrote um, Lafayette that the system was, on the whole, doing well, and he described the safety valves that gave vent to overheated passions in a system that carries within itself a relief against the infirmities from which the best of human institutions cannot be exempt. Um, but then his opinion started to change. So... Um, no easy answers here. Uh, the Civil War became the great test of the balance that the system had struck, not just struck, but had evolved toward. Uh, the seceding states felt 
free to succeed because their conception of their sovereignty and their crucial difference of policy over slavery. Madison described the three-fifths compromise when he was challenged on it in the years to come at the Constitutional Convention as a matter of political necessity. He said we couldn't have had the slaveholding states join with any degree of, of even reluctance if we hadn't had included that. And that was the, the best that he did. And his legacy on slavery is very, very complicated. Um, that's not that's not a particularly um, good part of it, of course. Uh, because we did not embed coercion in the Constitution, it always left open the possibility that the states would pull away from the Confederacy, which was the lesson that he gained from his study of ancient and classical Confederacies, was that states routinely pulled away from the federal center for things just like this. Um, so, uh, but what if he had prevailed in coercion? So I've been asking, my, I ask myself that all the time. What if he had won? Uh, if the federal government um, had been given coercive rights and a veto power over all state legislation, could that have forestalled or stopped the Civil War? Um, we have moved, definitely to bracket that question for a second, we have moved further in the direction of federal authority than certainly was in the Constitution. And the direction of constitutional law is all the half the audience is lawyers. Um, no, so when um, FDR threatened the Lochner court to, to pack the court, and that court had been striking down all the New Deal legislation, and then ultimately he won that battle, not through packing the court, but through getting different justices on there. You have, um, uh, you know, LBJ's battles ultimately to enforce Brown versus Board through federal statutes. The federal statutes started being enforced at the barrel of federal military authority. So you start having exactly this battle get played out in kind of the worst, not a civil war, but you start having coercion happen. Um, and then you have a lot of other federal legislative authorities that have been played out um, and that have strengthened. But you still have the supremacy clause as the guiding kind of idea behind um, this, this balance that we have struck. So um, we have the vacuum of coercion that he abhorred initially. Uh, you could describe that as either um, the productive, so it allows the productive venting of passions um, uh, the, what, what happens in the absence of coercion, or you could describe them as existential threats to the system. Certainly the Civil War was an existential threat to the Confederation itself. Um, uh, on number two, I would say that the state of our system, while we've been through traumas, is strong. The state of the ultimate federal, now we're 50 states, we're, you know, we, we grew just as Madison wanted in Federalist 10. He said we need to have an extensive republic. The bigger we get, the more, the more robust and and long-lasting will be, which was very surprising to a lot of people who wanted kind of the small agrarian republic. He said the bigger we get, the more strong we'll be. Um, well, we occasionally see existential threats to our federation. I mean, Texas, there's news like today that Texas is threatening, as they always do, to secede. It's not serious. Um, uh, what we do have, though, however, are quite are really wrenching debates about federal policy, where the lack of coercion, the lack of that original solution still does shape the debate. So we have Medicaid expansion because of the nature of our federalist system. The federal government generally can't force states to do stuff. It has to be within a, within a complicated doctrine of, of, um, of the supremacy clause. So um, gener you know, in the way that the Clean Power Plan, um, which, which President Obama recently announced, which hinges on the Clean Air Act and a Supreme Court ratified interpretation of the Clean Air Act, that still is each state has a system that's been designed for it through the administrative set. The, the state, this is how we've ended up in the absence of Congress just being able to tell states what to do or veto any contrary laws. So, but the counter argument would be um, that in the absence of a coercion clause, that it forced more of what the alternative was, which is politics and persuasion. Some violence, which is what happened in the, in the Civil War. Um, but uh, that's where I, I think, come out. And it is difficult to know what Madison himself would have argued um, because his own moral causes were idiosyncratic. Um, but I think it's safe to say that wherever he saw an issue as an existential threat to the Confederation itself, he would have urged federal action. 
Um, so for Madison, it was always the Constitution above all else as embodied in the federal nation state. Uh, And absent the clear right of federal coercion, um, there's always been room for profound disagreement between people of good faith on exactly what that means. And um, I think one of the reasons that he may have overcome his depression after the Constitutional Convention and thrown himself with such gusto precisely into politics about the Constitution was because he recognized well, I didn't get the easy answer of course of authority. Now we have to get everybody on board. And that probably ended up with a more robust um, answer. And so indeed, we end up at the final question whether the Civil War could have been overcome with the federal coercive right. That's a question for historians more sophisticated and knowledgeable than me. Um, but it's hard to imagine that even if we had had this coercive authority in the Constitution that the Civil War doesn't happen. I think that is, you know, these what ifs are almost impossible to, to do. Um, but when war did come to bind the nation together in blood, it was Lincoln. Lincoln becomes the great statesman of, of our nation's history, probably, because he stands by the unified nation state, the federal nation state, with this constitution above all else, despite all of the breaches and changes that happened during the conduct of the war, lifting of habeas corpus, everything else. Um, and the post-war amnesty measures were absolutely crucial to his legacy, where he says, at all costs, we're going to bind this nation back together, despite the staggering bloodshed. Um, the defiance of the states of the federal government afterward through reconstruction and segregation uh, show the limitation of a declaration of coercion as well. Um, coercion set apart from society and from politics never equaled union. And just in conclusion, there is a... a, a a former friend of mine, um, I worked for him when I was a student, so Michael Klarman, the, the UVA law. So he wrote a book, he's now at Harvard Law, he used to be at UVA, he wrote a, a, a powerful book called Jim Crow, From Jim Crow to Civil Rights, where his argument was that um, the law and lawsuits have limited power when it comes to changing society. Um, that's shown through the long kind of um, ineffectiveness of the Brown versus board decision, and he says that it was quickly evolving social positions that ultimately changed society while his law was not as effective as we might have hoped. And so when Bull Connor sh um, hosed the protesters, that changed opinions mightily and very quickly, and you had volcanic change start to happen quickly, and we've even seen that with the gay marriage decisions. Law was ineffective for a long time. Um, with the federal, with the Supreme Court striking down state law, um, striking down a federal law and, and state law, um, well, the federal law and then the, sorry, the state laws, the Supreme Court decision is striking down the state um, marriage laws. Uh, that was enabled by profound social change that's happening. So there's a balance between the courts, politicians, and society in resolving um, this federal state conflict, just as there's a balance between the institutions of federal government. And in all of this, I think there is a role for the largest goal of Madison's political philosophy, statesmanship, and for political and social leaders who educate, challenge, and lead society, and in so doing, continually rework the boundaries between federal and state governments who are, after all, comprised of human beings like them. Thank you very much. Of course. Right. Federal power. And I'm just curious if you garnered anything from Madison's views on the development under the Marshall Court and everything else of sort of this role of the federal judiciary as to sort of whether he thought that was one of the big concerns of the people seeing it as legitimate. Yeah. That one's a legislative expression of courts and the other being a judicial. Yeah. So a lot of the biggest battles that happened during the Constitutional Convention was about the federal judiciary. So if you, and, and during the, the, the passages during the ratifying convention where they're, um, one of the one of the most interesting things to write about in in the book was this battle about federal judges that happens in Richmond, and 
because it was very clear how much power these judges would, would have, and they were really being anointed almost like the Senate as, as kind of a, a body of statesmen who were going to be given um, authority over, the, over in a way that was not familiar to people who had a small, a kind of small D democratic idea of people in power. So think about our citizen legislatures in this country, which is kind of the default in most states. That's where you, you know, like in Virginia, you work, that's the Jeffersonian ideal. You work part time, very little money, very little staff. You're constrained at every instance. Federal judges in this vision were going to be much more powerful than that. And there was um, a, a, a completely fundamental debate that happened between Madison and Henry on whether we should be optimistic about judges themselves. And it kind of shot deep to these two different ideas of the country. And Madison said, um, you must trust me, we should have faith that the best of our country will rise into these positions. And we should trust them to make decisions in the country's own interest because of the constant, basically the constitutionalism, the, the civil society that we have in this country. That, and he made a lot of decisions around a pretty optimistic idea of what would bubble up from the American people themselves, which was a lot of people don't get because it is in tension with a lot more skeptical ideas, you know, that men will not be angels, all that stuff that comes up. Um, whereas the anti-federalists were the ones who were left to argue any system that depends on this kind of optimism is fatally flawed. And we reject it. And you should reject it too. And they lost that battle because it was part of the Constitution. And then that, that's all before the Supreme Court assuming um, judicial review powers. But you already had the federal, you know, the federal judiciary was being given powers of supremacy. Yes. Wrestling with the question of coercion, and to be in sort of rural Virginia, surrounded in a system that is so fundamentally based on coercion. Yeah. Uh, did that? Did his ideas of the need, the, the, the yeah. relationship of order and coercion, and I mean, was that informed by slavery? Or yes, I think so. So one of the things I do in the book is. Um, a number of things to say about this. His his grandfather, who was his paternal grandfather's name Ambrose, was murdered by his slaves. At least that was what the court found. And he was also this is some of the research the book is putting this together. Um, I think that he was a kind of distinctly brutal slave master, even for the time. And he was recognized and described that way by his contemporaries and. Father. Right, so he is, he's killed and dies through uh, poisoning about a year after he moves to Orange County and starts becoming kind of this titan there. And I think that one of the things that Madison drew from, his father kind of took this lesson, his father became a, a, a very strict, self-controlling um, person, but it was, I think Madison refined control to a level of nuance and never losing control. And always being, he, one of his, Paul Jennings, who served with him in the White House, said, I never saw, um, Madison exceeded every, um, he said, Negro around him in politeness. Or Madison said that about himself. He said, I will never be exceeded in politeness. So you had kind of this, this effort at decorum and at self-control so he would never lose his temper with you it was unfathomable that what what he what he would have done so there was that level um, I think in terms of his awareness of that moral problem that you're talking about so the it he was all over the map and it's very um, confusing and frustrating for scholars to try to impose to try to find consistency with it so on the one hand um, he freed a, a slave that came with him to Philadelphia named Billy, and he defied his father in doing that. And he, um, sold, under the laws of Pennsylvania at the time, you had to sell 
somebody, but it was with the knowledge that he would be manumitted by that new owner under Pennsylvania law. And then Billy and his family ended up becoming merchants who dealt with the Madisons um, in Philadelphia at the time. And he did, and the way that he described it to his father is he said, Billy will not, um, I forget the exact language, but basically suffer to be enslaved. That there was something about his very person that was defiant of that condition in a palpable way so that Madison said he can't stay like this. Which on the one seems very humane and, and, and bold. On the other hand, he, um, there was this campaign that was launched by Edward Coles, who had been his White, White House secretary, who later went on to run and win as governor of Illinois on an abolitionist platform after moving to Illinois from Virginia with his slaves so that he could free them. He, did, he ran this 10-year campaign of letters to uh, Madison and Dolly pleading with them, very heartfelt, agonizing to read, to free their slaves, either now or in their will, as other leaders had done. And Madison's letters back to him are infuriating. And he says, I don't think that, they, he gives multiple reasons, which as any lawyer can tell you is usually a sign that you don't have a good one. Like use one good reason, not three okay ones. And he gave, um, one of the reasons was that um, he actually said he couldn't afford it, which is the worst part. He said, we, we're suffering as it is. We can't run the farm. Um, if we had to sell one, then we could. And um, then he says, um, they'd be better off, they're better off here than they would be in a condition of freedom in Virginia. Um, but then on the other side of the ledger, he becomes the president in his 70s of the American Colonization Society, which is setting up Liberia. So that is you know, arguably a humane, at least it's a moral impulse seeking to express itself because he wants to solve, he wants to come up with, with a solution and probably the worst side of Madison's thinking is probably the one that you see in the coercion. He wants a simple, you know, brilliant solution, a light bulb that will shed light on things and that is to him what the, what the colonization effort was. So he was very preoccupied with this problem and then he, you know, the, 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 um, the, a kind of denouement of the book is when he goes and he's um, 70, I think he's, um, he's in his late 70s and he goes to the 1829 Virginia Constitutional Convention that's been struck to um, come up with a new constitution in Virginia during the Jackson era reforms. Virginia is now becoming a very conservative state, not a progressive one in terms of reforms and a lot of the tensions we see today actually about political design and, and so on. So at this, one of the big the, the big thing that he went down to start to fight about was counting African Americans in the basis for our legislative districts. Because they were, and he actually says, he says they're human beings. He says this is the way the country is going. He says this is the human thing to do. His arguments are very um, liberal and progressive. They're familiar to us now. And he spends all of his political capital, and it's very touching that he goes there as, as a, you know, the former president goes into this chamber, and he, he waits several, a, couple, a couple weeks to speak, and then when he speaks, the whole everybody gathers around him and it's really a scene and then they, he makes this speech and then basically he loses because it's the same redistricting politics that we see today where the western delegates because they had fewer um, uh, slaves and free blacks than the eastern half of the state did which was more commercial they would have lost about a third of their political seats they just opposed it on those grounds and they just said, we'll lose our political power, so you're gonna lose this one, and we're not gonna, and it was, it was incredibly dispiriting to him. So he is, um, there's probably a, a, I think that he was reflective about his relationship as a coercer in this, but it didn't, um, it doesn't explain his behavior totally, and it's, it's frustrating. Uh, in, I guess, at least modern 
So my my period in here is really what I spend 99% of my time thinking about is what came before the Constitutional Convention and the ratifying. But he did, um, so that's why I don't want to speak casually about the, the, the debate about the Bank of the United States, but he, somebody here may actually know the answer. I, I believe that he was, um, that the logic of being supportive of it was, was already with it. When he's arguing that the federal government should run monetary policy in the country and should be the redeemer of all currency and should control. Um, he was, I think, more supportive of what became the current federal government than we might think, contrasted with, um, with somebody like Jefferson, who really was staunchly for the agrarian, small, um, anti-government, um, government, an anti-government government, and Madison was not that guy in a way that some of his other contemporaries were. Um, yeah, I think he would have been surprised by the growth of the administrative state, by the growth of the plebiscitary presidency. I mean, there's been huge changes in our country that have been enabled by, um, you know, I mean, he had, um, he had very interesting checks on the evolution of the country. So when he went to the, the ratifying convention, to talk, um, the, the convention in 1829 for a new Virginia constitution, a lot of people have attacked him because he, he, wa he didn't want to extend the franchise to people who didn't have property. And I met with somebody once in Washington who hates him to this day because of that. He's, he came from Scottish American stock in the Appalachians, and he said, Madison would, he, he hated, he was unfair to my ancestors. And he, but he still supported the extension, of the franchise. He just talked about doing it with reluctance. So he saw the country evolving in that direction, and he was deeply pragmatic about trajectories. Um, so I think that he would have, um, you know, across all Western industrial countries, you've seen a growth of the, what you're talking about is the administrative state and the central banking. And um, I, I think that there's, I think that's almost unstoppable across these states. So I think that he would have not been kind of an idealist off in a corner. I think that he would have been very pragmatic about the evolution of the country. Thank you so much. Oh, and you're welcome. We have a, we have a much coveted uh, Charter for Society tie to give Oh, you. terrific. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.